Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about my research interest. Uh, I am Marisa Roberto, a professor in the Department of Molecular Medicine here at Scripps, where my laboratory studied the mechanism of action of drug of abuse and alcohol in particular. So alcohol or ethanol, I will use uh, this uh, terminology interchangeably, um, is the most used and abused recreational drug. So um, the good news is that not everybody that drinks a glass of wine becomes dependent. So um, let's make sure that I, uh, I explain what we study in the lab. So social drinking in a subpopulation of people becomes problematic and abusive, and then leads to alcohol dependence um, in less than 10% of the people. At this point in this progression to dependence, there are significant changes that occur in the brain, in specific brain region, and uh, there is a recruitment of the stress system happening. So there is a shift from drinking to feel good to drinking to feel normal, because at that point, when there is the pathology, People drink to alleviate the anxiety and uh, stress, the malaise that they experience when they don't have the drink or the drug, because these apply to all drug of abuse in general. So there is uh, uh, the excessive and uncontrollable drinking because individuals lose control over the amount and the times that they drink. And it's a vicious cycle that is progressive. So um, one factor to consider is that alcohol use disorder, it's a really big health issue um, throughout the world and accounts for thousands of deaths every year. And if you consider that uh, uh, excessive drinking is comorbid with anxiety, depression, stress disorder, that really makes it very hard for individual to maintain sobriety especially when it comes to time like this, that we are experiencing the pandemic where there has been a significant increase in sale of alcoholic beverage and pointed to the fact that people really drink more almost as a coping mechanism with the uncertainty of the current and future um, situation. And one evidence is that, you know, like alcohol use disorder um, also um, increased the severity of COVID-19 um, symptoms. So I mentioned that in the progression to become dependent on alcohol, uh, there are different changes in the brain that take place. So without going in detail on the complexity of this schematic where you have brain region they are color coded according to the stage of addiction the amygdala is this red brain region that we study in the lab and this brain region is really important for the negative effect for the anxiety and stress component that are characteristic of addiction so what we call it is really the dark side of addiction or what for me it's the devil part so we use a mechanistic approach. So what really we look at is how the communication uh, between neurons uh, is changed with chronic alcohol consumption. So uh, we look at the synaptic changes and those are electrical um, uh, recording we do of the activity of these neurons, not only in the amygdala, but also in circuitry that connect the amygdala to the rest of the brain, and we look at specific molecular target. So the overall objective of our research is always to identify the cellular and molecular mechanism in specific brain circuit and neurochemical system um, that really characterize the, the, the disease. Then when we know how, when, and where these changes occur, can we reverse them to prevent the negative, negative emotional state as well to 
decrease the excessive drinking that are the phenotype of addiction. Then ultimately, what we wish to do is to evaluate the efficacy of these identified druggable target, not only in the preclinical animal model that we use in the lab, but hopefully in the human laboratory model of alcohol dependence. And I will give you an example uh, shortly. As I said, we take a mechanistic approach um, and uh, uh, we, we use in vitro slice preparation of the amygdala. The amygdala drives the negative effect, as I mentioned already. This brain region contain GABA neuron mainly. GABA is the inhibitory signaling, the main inhibitory signaling in the brain. And those neurons in the amygdala also produce the stress peptide, the corticotropin releasing factor that is fundamental in, uh, in the process of becoming dependent on alcohol. And uh, our lab has shown the, that CRF not only is the main physiological regulator of the stress response, but plays a key role in dependence. So with this in mind, we take the electrophysiological approach and uh, my early work wanted to answer two basic questions. Does acute ethanol affect GABA signaling in the amygdala? And does chronic ethanol consumption that induce dependence affect the synapses as well? So uh, we use mice and rats, we make this animal dependent, and what we uh, study is uh, uh, the GABA signaling, whether it's a bulk or spontaneous, and we found that in the dependent animal, so animal treated for weeks with alcohol, have an elevated GABA responses, um, as you can see here, uh, compared to the non-drinker, the naive animal. Then when we acutely challenge the slices with ethanol, mimicking really what is happening the, on, during the acute intoxication, we further found an increase in GABA with ethanol. This is what we see in the slices, but we were also able to measure GABA level in freely moving animal with the dialysate and most importantly, blocking the CRF1 receptor that are the main receptor of, that mediate the stress response, the ethanol effects are gone. That really points to the, how the ethanol stress system are connected and synergistically increase GABA in the amygdala. So we were also interested in observing if this change that seems to be very correlating to the dependent state in rodents could be also observed in the non-human primates. So in a collaboration with the Oregon Center, we were able to study non-human primates and you can see that the amygdala of the drinker display significant elevation in GABA, pointed to a cross-species hallmark of dependence with this compromised GABA. So the approach we have taken in the lab through two decades is really to study the cellular mechanism of how this phenomenon is happening. I will spare the detail, but obviously we look intracellular pathway the lead to the GABA release, uh, including calcium channel. And uh, uh, another aspect we are looking at is whether other neurochemicals that are present in the brain are changed with chronic alcohol abuse. And uh, um, we divide them in generally pro-stressor. So those neurochemicals that actually increase GABA and the anti-stressor and how they actually are on the flip side of the coin, trying to decrease GABA, so being the anti-stress. So when we know how this um, mechanism work, uh, we take several approaches. One approach is to try to ameliorate these changes. And for instance, uh, uh, several years ago, we tested GABA pentane 
Gabapentin is a FDA approved drug for the cure of um, epilepsy and shingle pain. We tested it in our in vitro slice and we found that gabapentin decreased GABA and most importantly, decreased excessive drinking that is associated with dependence. Those data were really important for a later randomized clinical trial conducted here scripts by Dr. Barbara Mason that uh, she demonstrated that gabapentin is actually uh, able to decrease and alleviate drinking in a subpopulation of patients. We were really pleased to see that. Another way we do this because we know GABA is compromised, elevated with dependence, we take advantage of the amazing collaborator ES Krebs and particularly the chemistry department. So in a recent work with Ryan Shandy, we were able to test some of his synthetic GABA mimetic compounds. And we did find that some of the combined Ryan has produced are really effective in regulating GABA. Another approach we take is to study the new immune signaling as an integrator of both alcohol and stress response. Um, a lot of meta-analysis data uh, from post-mortem tissue of alcoholics point to the lifetime alcohol consumption being uh, exponentially correlated to the brain neuroimmune activation. So there are there is new information uh, that develops with chronic alcohol consumption and lead to the cytokine hypothesis of alcohol use disorder. So the way we approach this is to look really at specific pro-inflammatory signaling and anti-inflammatory signaling. So looking at interleukin that I list here a few and how manipulated those system can affect drinking. And this is work through the INA consortium that basically has the main goal to repurpose FDA drugs already approved for anti-inflammatory disease as anti-inflammatory for several diseases, but taken to the alcohol use disorder. So um, one approach we took, because microglia are the main um, primary immune cell in the brain, we wanted to ask whether alcohol dependent activate microglia. And yes, it does. Looking at central amygdala and cortical area, there is a significant activation of microglia with chronic alcohol consumption. Then the question was whether depleting, blocking microglia would affect the drinking phenotype. And surely it did. We depleted microglia. Uh, successfully with uh, uh, Plexigon, and we observe a significant decrease in the drinking uh, associated with dependent. And when it comes to GABA signaling, actually depletion of microglia decreased the elevation in GABA that we observe in dependent animal. So to bring it all back together in our schematic, we still have the synapses. Now we have added cytokine and the receptor. We have a different intracellular pathway and mediator of the cytokine effect. And in addition, we also have microglia as a new druggable cell type. So the, the, our model, our intent is to test through the INIA consortium anti-inflammatory drugs that are FDA approved and to assess whether they normalize the uh, compromise GABA and they also alleviate the drinking phenotype. With this, I would like to thank you for watching. And uh, I really want to thank all the uh, current members in my lab. Without them, this work would not be possible. Obviously, the former member as well, and my value, the collaborator, is scripts and outside scripts, and the generous funding from NI888 and the Pearson Center. Thanks.